Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Appreciate the, the very thorough opening. Um, and I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us here today. And this is the first SCAG Housing Policy Forum. Um, and this is an issue that, as we all know, is, well, core to a lot of the things that we're dealing with on the policy front. Um, so before I begin, I want to acknowledge some fellow SCAG elected officials who have joined the forum today. We have our second vice president, Carmen Ramirez, supervisor of Ventura. We have Art Brown, Juan Carrillo, John Dutre, Margaret Finley, Peggy Wong, Jed Leno, uh, Maricela Magana, Diana Mahmood, Frank Navarro, David Pollock, Jesus Silva, and Colleen Wallace. And I know that we have a bunch of other electeds on the line today. So if you could, um, so that we can acknowledge you, please put your thumb up in the chat box below and really th thank you all for taking time to focus on this important subject. Um, as you know, SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments is the largest metropolitan planning organization, MPO, in the United States. We cover six counties, um, 191 cities, 19.1 million people. If we were our own country, uh, I believe we would be the 15th largest economy in the world. And <laughs> We, we know, but housing, 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 it keeps coming up uh, in everything we talk about. As local elected officials, many of us are going through our housing element update right now. Um, of course, at SCAG, we deal with this with um, RENA. We also provide, we've been able to provide funding with help from the legislature with REAP and LEAP. Um, but housing, it's, it's all interconnected we are absolutely having a supply problem um, and we, we need to figure out a way to build through this and get out of this. We also have an affordability problem. And of course, then this is tied to transportation and jobs and well, the list goes on. It's all interconnected, but housing is the topic of the day. Um, already talked about LEAP, REAP, and RENA, and of course, Connect SoCal. Um, SCAG is very focused on housing, and hence why we're having this uh, forum. And what we're also today going to be talking about legislation and how Sacramento, D.C. have changed some of the ways that we are focusing on or being able to address this problem. And um, some of, SCAG is a pro-housing organization um, and we support legislation that provides tools and incentives uh, for local jurisdictions to be able to build. Some examples of this legislation that SCAG has weighed in on include ACA 1, SB 7, SB 10, and SB 15. And I believe we're going to be going into some of those a little bit later on in the discussion. Um, the challenge remains balancing local control with intervention from the state. SB9 is a key example of this, something that SCAG was against and uh, legislature governor ended up moving forward with it. And, but it absolutely infringes upon local control. And this goes back to looking for those tools, those incentives where we can work together with the state to uh, facilitate housing development in our region. And, we need, again, more tools, less rules coming out of Sacramento. We want to be good partners. We are partners, and we want to work collaboratively on this. Um, that being said, uh, you know, the state is helping us out uh, in, in certain areas, and that includes the, the funding for our REAP program, our LEAP program. And um, I want to thank the state legislators for providing funding for that. Um, I could go on, but I'm not going to. In fact, I'm going to pass this on to our executive director, Kome Ajise. But really, I, I hope that you're able to take a lot away from this today.
take it back and put it into action in your local communities. And really, uh, this is the issue of the day. And I'm so happy to see so many people turn out to do this. And thank you again. Enjoy the conference. And Mr. Jise, are you on the line? I am, sir. How are you? Great, great. Welcome. Please. Thank you. Oh, thank you, President Lorimore, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's our privilege at SCAG to host um, this housing forum. Um, as you all know, housing uh, is, uh, has become this running crisis in our region and, and across the state, quite frankly. Um, this crisis has been decades in the making, uh, and it's come to a uh, kind of a, a, a crescendo at this point. And, and we're uh, actively involved in the SCAG, as uh, President Laura Moore said. As Southern California's regional planning organization, um, SCAG has a number of housing programs. Uh, we're not typically involved in housing. Um, what we were in, except for the, uh, the, 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 the festival, the party we, we, we throw every eight years called RENA. Uh, it's one of those parties that um, we're obligated to to hold and nobody enjoys coming to and nobody enjoys being at, uh, but we're, uh, we're obligated anyway at state, uh, as a result of state law to do it. Uh, we think it can be better. I think RENA is essential in the planning process and we think it can be better. Uh, and it should, uh, it should be uh, made to in fact function in a way that solves housing crisis for us. Um, there's been a number of programs uh, since um, this last arena, um, the 2020, uh, the six cycle arena. Uh, there's been some programs at SCAG that um, allows us to be more fully engaged in housing rather than just wait every eight years to do this. Um, and, and those programs, have, some of them have been mentioned by uh, President Laura Moore uh, with the intent that it provides funding for us to, um, to, for planning and production of housing in our region. Uh, one of them is the REAP program, the Regional Early Action Planning Program, which is a, is, uh, is a direct result of AB 101. Uh, there is a local level, a local uh, uh, com uh, companion to that called LEAP. Uh, that was in last year's uh, state budget bill. Uh, the REAP program is focused on planning. Um, and, and some of the programs though at SCAG, is, we're using them to help our cities and our counties to prepare the housing elements at this point, uh, which is uh, the last step in the RENA process. Uh, developing those plans and programs that set the stage ultimately and hopefully to accelerate housing production. It also allows us to spend some resources on outreach and education, uh, which I think is important. And this forum is an example of that. And I wanna take a moment to just thank um, uh, the team that's behind this, um, our facilitators, and of course, our panelists that you're going to hear uh, from. Um, we feel very privileged to be able to host this forum to begin to uh, ensure that we all have a common understanding, uh, not just of the crisis that is in front of us, but also of the potential solutions that we might bring to bear such, such that each local agency can uh, enable uh, and engage in, in, in getting housing production uh, started. Uh, one, there are a couple of things I wanna mention about the REAP program that we have um, that I think are important um, things to consider as to why these are programs we wanna support. Uh, the REAP funding itself that the last one we got um, uh, is allowed us to create some in, uh, innovative and out of the box programs, um, such as the housing, uh, Regional Housing Leadership Academy, which is intended to educate and enable our local elected officials, our community leaders on pro-housing issues. Uh, we also have a partnering that we um, engaged with the California Community Foundation to fund capacity building grants with local housing nonprofit organizations such that we can bring uh, more voices to the table that would allow us to actually address the issue at a more granular level. And then finally, we also have the opportunity through the reprogram to partner with USC to develop a toolkit um, for our cities to be able to convert uh, underutilized commercial spaces, uh, commercial land uses to much needed uh, residential housing. So these are opportunities, just examples of opportunities that we've seen just with this reprogram. 
In addition to REAP, uh, we also have what is known as REAP 2021, which is the follow on to the REAP program that's in this year's current uh, budget uh, bill. Um, it's a step, uh, this sort of takes uh, the initiative of getting us involved in housing a little one step further uh, than the original grant because it focuses more on housing production as opposed to just planning and, 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 uh, and uh, capacity building. So because, because the REAP 2021 has more resources in it, we're able to spend some more resources on actually getting at housing production. While the program is still in its initial, initial um, um, formation stage, we're looking for rulemaking at this time at the state level. Uh, we hope to be able to begin to have conversations in our region that hopefully influences how those rules are made such that uh, it, it serves the end that uh, President Lorimer talked about, uh, where we get more tools instead of rules uh, from Sacramento to enable us to uh, engage in housing production. Um, we also expect that this program, the REAP 2021, will allow us to do some infrastructure uh, uh, improvements as well, uh, some housing supportive infrastructure. And, and so that's another exciting element of the REAP 2021. Uh, what we learned today uh, can help us to craft uh, this programs going forward and really appreciate all of you joining us and uh, engaging in this very, very serious uh, regional uh, policy issue. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us. And I will hand it over to, I guess, Jenna at this point. Great. All right. Thank you, Kome. Thank you, President Lorimore, for kicking us off. Um, my name is Jenna Hornstaff. I'm Deputy Director of Planning for Land Use um, at SCAG. And I have the great pleasure of working closely with our team on the REAP program that Kome mentioned. I am, it's so exciting to see so much interest um, in housing policy and recent legislation from stakeholders as we saw in our poll from across the region. Um, and this is what we're trying to do with the outreach component of our REAP funds is bring leaders and influencers together from diverse backgrounds from across our region to work together to solve our housing, transportation and climate equity challenges. So we wanna do one more quick poll to get you engaged and hopefully you've got the Slido app uh, working for you. Um, so we want to ask you um, about your professional and lived experience. We want to see where you're joining us from today. So hopefully, it, there we go. We're we going to see the results live. Start entering in Slido for the next poll. Where are you coming from? Oh. Coming in. No, there we go. Ooh, all right. We see a lot right now of elected officials, which is great, and government agency staff, housing developers, CBOs, um, other advocates from our intersectional areas of, of transit, climate, environment. Uh, no employers and labor organizations yet. Okay, it looks like we have a close tie with the housing development and finance world and the CBOs. Um, and then um, oh, a little bit of the employers just showed up. It looks like we have a lot of public agency staff and elected officials, which is great. I mean. All of us here need to know what, what just happened at the state uh, and federal level. So thanks for sharing that information. So as noted, this is our first in a series of four forums. We're going to hold these quarterly. They're going to be open to the public, and they are really to help share information, but also learn what are the key areas of interest for our regional partners. Again, this is part of our REAP planning grant program funded by the state. Um, and it's also um, the first uh, kickoff to our Global Housing Policy Leadership Academy. And Comey mentioned this program, and I'll let you know at the end of today's session, we're going to do a closer preview of the Leadership Academy, which is just going to be an amazing opportunity for those of you who want to just totally geek out and take a deeper dive on how to advance housing policies, housing production in your communities, and really become an expert on all things um, related to being pro-housing and accelerating housing production. So um, we're going to be using tools like this poll throughout the day to, to hear from you about trends and opportunities and also to hear what areas you're interested in for future programming. Um, and so with that, I'm going to just give you a quick review of our agenda. I think that will come up. Yep, there it is. Um, so we're in our welcome session, and then we're going to have a 30-minute panel on the federal budget and legislation related to housing. Then we're going to have a full hour on the state budget and state legislation because it's a lot to cover. The state has been very active on housing. 
Um, and then both of these panels will be interspersed with some moments for you to react, um, interact, share your thoughts through the Slido system. Um, then at the end of this, we're going to come back and I'm going to give you this preview of our Leadership App, uh, Academy opportunity and how you can apply, talk a little bit about our next forums. So that is the run of show today. Um, and with that, I'm going to say see you soon. And I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Lassar. She is the founder and CEO of the Global Policy Leadership Academy and of Lassar Development Consultants. So Jennifer, kick us off. Thank you so much, Jenna. And good afternoon, everybody. I am your moderator today for our 30-minute panel focused on federal housing policy and legislation. Um, I'm honored to be joined by Anna Leva, Vice President from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and Mike Kingsella, Chief Executive Officer of Up for Growth. And in a minute, I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. Um, but I just want to tell you that what we're going to cover today is the latest information on uh, federal housing policy initiatives, and, and many of you probably know we're not quite yet done um, in Washington on the infrastructure panel, so our guests will be able to give you the most up-to-date information that we have. Um, we're going to also talk about um, uh, the, the, the dollars in the, in the infrastructure packages, key federal um, legislation that it has been in the works and is continuing, and then where we really are now uh, with COVID uh, funding and also what we hope to accomplish in the next few years for what that vision looks like. So with that, let me just start by having um, Anne and then Mike uh, take a few minutes and um, introduce themselves, talk about their organizations and kind of the lens at which they look at policy. Anne. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you all in Southern California. Uh, again, Anne Oliva, I am the Vice President for Housing Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And I, I think about the lens that I bring to this conversation in two ways. Uh, the first is I'm a, for, a former federal official. I spent 10 years at the Department of Housing and Urban Development largely working on special needs and homelessness programs. But I've also spent the last four and a half years working in the field, including in Southern California and San Diego and Los Angeles, uh, to see how the policy that I developed when I was at the federal level has played out and to really understand what the challenges and barriers are um, and what the opportunities are uh, in Southern California and in other communities across the country. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where I am now, is not an advocacy organization. We are actually a policy shop, a think tank. Uh, we do a lot of analysis in order to inform uh, elected leaders and, um, and appointed leaders at the federal and state and local level, uh, sort of as our name suggests on budget and policy issues that really is based on data and impact. We focus on low and moderate income people and we have a racial justice uh, and a justice sort of overall orientation to our work. And then the last thing I'll say about us is that housing is one of several policy areas that we work in. Uh, we also work in food security, healthcare, uh, tax, immigration, and we do work at the state level as well. So we, cr we cut across a number of intersectional issues uh, as we think about housing and, uh, and all of these pieces that, that one of our other speakers noted. Lots of these things are, are connected. And thank you so much, and we're, we're so pleased to have you. Um, let me turn to Mike Kingsella. Mike, uh, why don't you introduce yourself uh, to our, our forum participants today, and then I'll explain the structure of our, of our dialogue together, and then we'll jump right in. Great. Well, thank you, Jennifer and Anne. Good to see you again. Really excited to participate in this conversation. Anne and I were on a panel, what, a year ago, I think, working on emergency rental assistance. Right. Um, so by way of background, um, my name is Mike Kingsella, as Jennifer shared, CEO of Up for Growth. Uh, we are a national 501c3 cross-sector member network that is laser focused on a mission uh, to uh, forge policies in partnerships across sectors to achieve housing equity, eliminate systemic barriers, and ultimately create more homes. Uh, you know, no matter if you're in a city or a suburb or rural America, the cost of housing and the supply out of it is being grossly outstripped, um, or, or rather grossly outstripping um, salaries and, and demand. 
And so um, for far too many Americans, uh, because of this, uh, what we call underproduction, um, uh, far too many uh, can't afford to live well uh, where they work, play, and gather. And so our mission is to really work on policy um, and again, developing cross-sector networks of policymakers, community advocates, and stakeholders, and practitioners to break down systemic barriers and, and, and really help solve uh, our nation's underproduction of homes. Uh, in terms of uh, a policy lens or focus, uh, we're really focused on how can we support communities um, in eliminating um, exclusionary and restrictive zoning, um, discriminatory, uh, oftentimes land use policies that inhibit um, communities from being elastic in terms of meeting housing needs? Um, how can we create more inclusive and equitable communities, particularly when it comes to equitable access to opportunity? Um, and unfortunately for far too many Americans, um, the zip code where you're born being the greatest determinant of your economic, social, and health outcomes um, is, is tied um, uh, inextricably um, to patterns of inequitable um, uh, land use policies and zoning decisions made over decades going back a century. Um, so that's really our organization's lens and our mission is to really reverse uh, 100 years of exclusionary policies and patterns. And that's how we approach this housing issue. Thank you, Mike. Um, so what you just heard from um, Ann and Mike is that they, they bring uh, different perspectives and works with a, a think tank uh, and comes out of a background uh, at HUD where she was actually the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs. Her organization is very focused on low and, and moderate income um, uh, funding programs and, and empowerment of, of low and moderate income uh, people and communities. Mike comes out of more of a planning and development background. He actually works for an advocacy organization. It's kind of a housing for all perspective, uh, trying to lower the barriers to production. Um, so just want you to know that we've kind of put together uh, two folks with um, complementary uh, viewpoints to get the, the full spectrum of, of what's going on. So we're going to have uh, about 20 minutes of questions. Um, uh, we're going to take turns in each. There's, I mean, uh, there's four, four areas. We're going to take turns in each. Mike will go first once, Anne will go first once. And I just want to tell you, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID. And then we're going to talk about what happened in Washington, D.C., or what's happening right now with the infrastructure package. And then we're going to um, move to talking about the, the, there's about six key bills. We're going to talk about four to six of the key bills uh, that are underway in Washington. And then we're going to just end our last round with a, talking about uh, the forecast. What's the work that we still need to do ahead? Um, so I wanted to let you know that that's this. And then we're going to leave five minutes for um, question and answers at the end. And our staff are curating those in, in Slido for us. Um, so, uh, Anne, we're going to start, uh, uh, actually, Mike, we're going to start with you in our first round um, talking about COVID. Um, and the, the question uh, really for, for you and Anne, Anne we're going to have you talk a little bit more actually about COVID resources as well. But for both of you, how did COVID impact your thinking about um, policy work and going forward? And what did it expose that's really changed um, how you do your work today? Mike, we'll start with you. Sure, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to kick us off. I mean, from our perspective, uh, the the COVID uh, pandemic um, really exposed uh, inequities um, that have existed for for years and decades um, in in the housing market. Um, you know, how the idea of how can you shelter in place when you don't have stable access um, to shelter. And so I think in many ways, um, in looking at those um, unhoused folks, um, looking at folks um, on the edge um, and in housing unstable situations, you know, this, 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 this pandemic has really um, shown a spotlight on the extent to which we have a housing shortage, um, with, which is um, severely cost burdening over, over 11 million um, American renter households and really contributing um, to not only housing um, uh, affordability challenges, um, but really plays into um, a lack of resiliency uh, when it comes to large economic or public health um, crises uh, on the part of millions of, of households. And so for us, you know, as we sort of look longer term beyond the recovery um, from the COVID uh, pandemic, um, it is more important than ever before uh, to really address um, issues around housing supply, access to housing, access to quality and stable 
um, housing and housing equity. Um, I think more immediately, and this is where our organization was focused over the past year, is there's a real lack of um, structures um, to get uh, housing uh, resources out to the millions of Americans that were even before the pandemic experiencing cost burdening. Um, and so this discussion around emergency rental assistance um, was, a, was a major focus of ours um, really in that immediate, uh, in that immediate term. But, but again, you know, as, we, as we look ahead to 2022, 2023 and beyond, um, our perspective is until we get enough housing, um, we're not going to have the real resiliency necessary um, to deal with similar crises uh, down the road. Thank you, Mike. So certainly part of the COVID response long term is, is really making sure we're going to have adequate and affordable supply. Um, and can you share, and I know you know the funding so well, and I'm so grateful. Can you share with us where, where are we with uh, COVID resources today? Obviously, a lot have flowed, but I, I think that they're going to continue to flow. And what do the COVID resources mean as we really begin to focus on equitable access um, to housing in our communities? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's, it's really important. And I think I just wanna put a really fine point on something that both you and Mike have mentioned, and that is the same people, the same historically marginalized groups of people who are um, disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 have been disproportionately impacted over the history of our housing uh, policy in this country. And that has, all of those things have sort of, um, we've, we've had a spotlight put on it uh, because of the, of the pandemic, but, but they existed prior prior to the pandemic. I mean, just as an example, we saw five straight years of increases in unsheltered homelessness in this country, uh, sort of going into the pandemic. So these resources that have been uh, put on the street since the beginning of the pandemic, since the CARES Act last year are incredibly important. Uh, the, in the chat, there is a link to a great resource that a group called the Framework for an Equitable COVID-19 Homelessness Response put together. Uh, it includes, it's the, first, uh, it's the first link in the chat. It includes a nice chart that provides the attributes of the four programs that we really track here at the center. Uh, the first is the emergency rental assistance program that Mike also talked about. That's nearly $50 billion in emergency rental assistance funding. It's in the news a lot, one, because it's really a lot of money for, in terms of scale. It is uh, more than the housing world has seen in a long time. Uh, it was a little slow to start and got, and got some criticism for that, but what we've seen from the data that Treasury is putting out, uh, just the most recent data that came out last week, that program is ramping up quite quickly and significantly. Uh, and then I think the most important thing to know now, especially for California, is that Treasury is going to start recapturing uh, funds that are unspent in some communities and redistributing them to communities that are uh, meeting the the sort of expenditure requirements that are laid out in both the statute and their, and their guidance. So that's the biggest of the four programs that we're tracking. We also have the Emergency Solutions Grant CV program, which in Southern California, I think has been quite important. It really provides funding for uh, people experiencing homelessness. So uh, services for people who are unsheltered as well as paying for shelters, especially in places where FEMA funds can't help communities uh, get people uh, inside and stay inside uh, and transition them into permanent housing. And then the two programs that are a little bit newer, you all um, sure have seen the Emergency Housing Voucher Program or EHV. Uh, that is really a partnership between local continuums of care or, or homeless service agencies and public housing authorities. The public housing authorities received 70,000 vouchers nationwide and they are a uh, just about a little, little bit under 10% spent, but that doesn't seem alarming to me given that these are permanent vouchers um, and that uh, you know, there was some ramp up needed in order to make the kinds of connections that, that folks really wanted to see between homeless service systems and public housing authorities. I would say what I'm hearing out in the field for the, in terms of challenges is really around accessing services for people who need them in that program. I'm happy to take some questions about that. 
And then the last thing I would note is the Home Investment Partnerships Program, which is generally a supply side program, also received $5 billion. And uh, that is just getting underway. HUD recently put out their guidance on that. And because it is a production program, that will take a little bit longer before we see, before we see the results that we wanna see. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you both. I wanna shift to Washington, DC. I know when we talked last week, we actually thought we might have a signature uh, or uh, over, the, over the weekend, but um, uh, the text of the uh, Build Back Better plan is out, but uh, it's not done. So Mike, we'll start with you, but where are we uh, with getting the two infrastructure um, packages done? And from your standpoint, a supply standpoint, are there any key messages and policy trends you see uh, in the work that's being done in Washington? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, I think that, you know, the bigger context is earlier this year, uh, we saw the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, or it's known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, move through um, the Senate. Um, and, you know, it was kicked over to the House. Um, and of course, that legislation, about a billion um, actually broadly did not include housing. However, there were provisions that we do like uh, from a housing and transit perspective in the bill, one in which uh, encourages and provides a framework uh, for metropolitan planning organizations to more closely align land use and, and zoning policies uh, with transportation investments. And I think that's a, a very, very salient um, provision um, to SCAG. Um, and other sub uh, MPOs throughout the Southern California region, particularly with the investments um, in uh, 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 Los Angeles region's uh, transit system. Um, but outside of that provision, um, the, uh, the bipartisan um, legislation did not include housing investments. Housing really was left um, to the uh, budget reconciliation package currently known as the Build Back Better Act. Um, as we saw earlier this, this year, 3.5 trillion was the top line number. Uh, there was a lot of excitement around this with provisions for healthcare and families, uh, as well as housing to the tune of about 330 billion. Um, that package uh, through negotiations has now uh, been scaled back uh, to about 1.75 trillion uh, and uh, was released uh, last week uh, through an announcement by the president um, up on the Hill. Uh, and Congress continues uh, to work on this. Um, there was text released on Friday, um, and we know that as that overall package uh, went from 3.5 trillion to 1.75, uh, fortunately housing uh, remained, um, but it is down to 150 billion. Having said that, 150 billion for housing is still a historic investment um, in housing resources. So we know that the package includes um, a variety of investments in housing, um, boosting housing supply, reducing price pressures, uh, enabling construction rehab and improvement of more than 1 million affordable homes. Um, the bill uh, also includes uh, historic investments in rental assistance, expanding vouchers, um, uh, as well as um, uh, investments in more equitable communities um, through investing in community-led uh, redevelopment projects in historically under-invested neighborhoods, um, including removal of lead paint from hundreds of thousands of homes. The piece that we're really focused on from a supply perspective and this issue of reversing uh, a century of exclusionary policies um, is what is called the Unlocking Possibilities Program. Uh, and this is a competitive grant program to be created at HUD uh, that would create resources to enable state and local zoning reforms, um, enabling more families to find housing opportunities in high opportunity uh, neighborhoods. So in the framework that was presented on the top of the call, uh, this is uh, more tools, um, less mandates, right? It's, it's to enable communities that want to enact common sense zoning reforms to break down artificial barriers to housing uh, to do so. Um, and we are very excited um, about this legislation uh, and, and look forward to working with HUD on its implementation uh, in the coming year. So again, you know, it's not all about zoning. Um, addressing housing underproduction is both about zoning reform and eliminating artificial barriers, but also boosting resources for affordable housing production through investments in home, CDBG, 
housing trust fund, other critical production focused programs. I will say um, that one issue uh, that we have been uh, tracking that has not made it into the current draft legislative text and in some ways is pending um, work on the part of the Joint Center on, on tax is uh, the low income housing tax credit uh, enhancements um, that Senator Cantwell and, and Wyden and Young have been championing, um, as well as the Neighborhood Homes uh, Investment Act, uh, which is the creation actually of a new tax credit um, that would help address the appraisal gap, um, enabling um, uh, folks in uh, historically disinvested communities uh, through the upper Midwest and, and Northeast in particular um, to take existing but underutilized or dilapidated housing stock, put it back in a service for workforce, housing, and home ownership opportunities. Both of those elements were not included uh, in the new framework, but they are not dead. And, and so from an advocacy perspective, it's really important that those who are advocating uh, before their members of Congress um, let members know how important these provisions are and urge their inclusion. Um, in the final version of the reconcil budget reconciliation uh, package. So um, those are the pieces that weren't in the new framework. Um, but again, you know, this is continuously evolving. Um, and just as recently as a, a few minutes ago, I received a message that Ma uh, Senator Manchin is, is a bit um, um, uh, 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 wavering a bit on the $1.75 trillion uh, top line. So, you know, this is all very much in play and um, uh, moving real time as we speak. Mike, thank you. Um, you know, and as Mike said, we've been talking about a $1.75 uh, trillion basically social safety net package, $150 billion for housing. Maybe one of our team can post the, the um, bill uh, language in the, in the chat. The, uh, uh, our details start on page 672 of 1,438 pages, I think. Um, but Anne, um, uh, and I know we've talked a little bit about this, what are you most excited about um, in, in this package that is actually kind of game changing? Um, and, and how do you see the package getting done over the next few days? I wish I had a crystal ball to tell you how the package uh, uh, is going to get done over the next few days. Mike is absolutely right. I haven't even had a chance to dig into um, the, the remarks from the pe press conference that Senator Manchin had. Uh, but what, what we're really excited about at the Center, um, the, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the National Low Income Housing Coalition and the National Alliance to End Homelessness, uh, along with Opportunity Starts at Home, which is a jointly operated um, initiative, really have been pushing forward on three priorities that are the most deeply targeted to people with the lowest incomes. Um, the first is, which doesn't impact Southern California as much as, as areas of the East Coast, but it was really being able to do capital improvements to public housing. I know Los Angeles certainly has some public housing. Uh, they, we were losing you know, 10 to 15,000, I believe, units of public housing every year just due to uh, you know, maintenance that hasn't been kept up with and capital improvements that haven't been kept up with. So that's incredibly important. Uh, as, as Mike also mentioned, there's, 20, there's $65 billion for public housing improvement in this package. Uh, the Housing Trust Fund, the National Housing Trust Fund, and the HOME program, both of which are quite deeply targeted, the trust fund being very deeply targeted to people at the lowest incomes, receive $25 billion. But the thing that the center is most excited about is this historic investment in an expansion of the Housing Choice Voucher Program and um, project-based rental assistance. And this package looks a little bit different than maybe other housing choice voucher expansions that are done through appropriations. It includes uh, resources for mobility to help families move into opportunities of their choice uh, that they really wanna move into that are maybe high opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, and we also have funding for landlord engagement, which is something I know is really important to the folks in Southern California to ensure that we have access to units that are out there while we are building the supply that is also needed. So those are the three priorities that, that we have had over the last six or eight months, and all three of them have been funded at, at what we think are really good solid levels. And I just want to ask a follow-up question because I remember that that I think you shared this with me in the voucher program, 
there's also a set aside for folks who are homeless. Is that right? Yes, thank you so much for asking that. There is uh, about a third of the money, $7 billion, is set aside for people who are experiencing homelessness, at risk of homelessness, and survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking. That is a huge investment uh, to serve people uh, who, who have been historically marginalized. Uh, and, and I think we can really use this investment to help us uh, try and, and, and address those increases that I talked about at the top of this discussion uh, of unsheltered homelessness that we've seen in Southern California and other places across the country. So I just want everybody to, to um, I wanna share what Ann actually told me that I think is so pivotal in that. So generally homelessness money are grant sources in kind of its own part of HUD. And this is the first time we're really linking um, housing or homelessness to permanent rental assistance and attaching it to housing. So we're, we're kind of marrying this housing supply issues and the rent and the rent supports for the homeless population. So again, kind of a, a, a maybe a seemingly small uh, amount of vouchers, but a pretty significant shift. That's right. um, yep. And so uh, I, I just want to turn now, uh, we have probably about six more minutes um, and just briefly have you guys recap the the six key bills. So Anne, we're going to start with you. Uh, there are two uh, bills by uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Um, and I wondered if you just maybe take about 30 or 40 seconds on each one and and share with our uh, our audience. And then Mike, uh, there are sort of four, uh, three, three key bills kind of on House, housing supply and housing development. And again, if you could just take maybe 30 or 40 seconds on, on each. Uh, and then uh, for our staff, we'll ask that you uh, queue up any, any questions from our audience. So Anne, um, on the Maxine Waters bills, to you. Uh, I'm just so pleased. I think in the, in the chat as well um, is a link to my testimony that was uh, from June of, of this year when uh, Chairwoman Waters introduced the Ending Homelessness Act of 2021. And there were previous versions of this, of this particular act, none of which actually, I think, tried to end homelessness, and this one does. And the reason that it does is because it actually uh, creates a universal housing voucher program so that all people over the course of of a few years of implementation so that all people who are eligible for the Housing Choice Voucher Program can actually receive one. Right now, only one out of every four households that is eligible for a voucher uh, receives it. And it couples that with policy changes to the program like uh, that are incredibly important, like um, ensuring that there are protections against source of income discrimination, which is something that we see across across the board, as well as providing landlord incentives and funding for outreach. So that is a really important uh, piece of legislation on the ending homelessness side, but also on the affordability side, because it is the first time I think that we've seen uh, universal housing vouchers as part of a legislative package. It is coupled with uh, deliberately with the Housing is Infrastructure Act, which actually provides the corresponding supply side uh, funding in order to ensure that the, that the areas uh, across the country that have an affordable housing shortage in supply can build that supply. So you actually have to kind of look at them together in order to really get a sense for what the chairwoman was trying to accomplish. Thank you. And I know all these bills, um, we're going to have handouts for everybody. Um, Mike, I want to make sure we end at one. Uh, so can you just briefly uh, give us a summary of the other key housing bills? Yeah, of course. I mean, ours are focused, our priorities are focused on exclusionary zoning and solving the housing under production. I mean, America fell 7.3 million homes short of meeting housing needs just from 2000 to 2015. And so these pieces of legislation, the Housing Supply and Affordability Act, the Build More Housing Near Transit Act, and the Yes in My Backyard or YIMBY uh, Act are all targeted at uh, addressing uh, and enabling communities to remove artificial barriers which perpetuate uh, the underproduction and are frankly increasing the underproduction of many communities coast to coast. Um, housing supply and afford they're all bipartisan. Housing Supply and Affordability Act uh, introduced by Senator Amy Klobuchar and Rob Portman is what has become uh, the Unlocking Possibilities program in the budget reconciliation legislation. This is the only, this is really important because this is the only 
provision in the entire package that deals with helping communities eliminate exclusionary zoning. So it's not just about building more housing, but it's about tearing down systems and policies that perpetuate inequitable access to opportunity vis-a-vis -vis how do we get more uh, housing opportunities and attainable and affordable homes in high opportunity places. Build More Housing Near Transit Act, sponsored by um, San Diego uh, Member of Congress, uh, Congressman Scott Peters, also uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, a Republican from rural Washington state. Um, this bill creates a carrot, um, a benefit uh, to transit agencies and local governments who together um, work side by side to align land use and zoning policies with future transit investments. And then finally, uh, the Yes in My Backyard Act takes a sunshine as the best disinfectant uh, approach um, to this issue, which is, hey, we're not gonna mandate or tell uh, individual local governments from a federal perspective, what specific policies to implement, but we know that we need to address housing under production and we need to address housing equity. And here's a checklist of 21 best practice policies from allowing duplexes ADUs uh, up to quads in single detached zones to parking reform um, in, able to get it, in, in order to get there. Um, and so it's a yes, no checklist, um, really again takes a sunshine as the best disinfectant approach um, to helping communities have these important conversations and increase data transparency for folks at HUD um, and other policymakers to understand what specifically to incentivize in the future to get to those outcomes. So all three of, of those bills are in various stages of moving forward. We are very optimistic about unlocking possibilities moving to the president's desk this year um, and look forward to continuing our efforts around these other two pieces of legislation as we move into 2022 as well. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, for each of you, we're just gonna elevate one question uh, uh, and so we have plenty of time for our state panel too. And again, I just want everybody to know that there are um, gonna be a handouts after today's session, but um, many people have asked the qu question about corporate ownership. Um, so the question really is, and if maybe you could each take, again, 30 or 40 seconds. Um, for the first time in Los Angeles history, most of the housing stock is owned by corporations and private developers. How can we prevent corporate consolidation? And we'll start with you. Uh, I think we probably should have started with Mike. He's probably better okay. at this than I am. Mike, Mike, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start with you. And Anne, I'll, I'll let you maybe draw a policy thread from that uh, 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 to share, and then, and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll transition. Well, I, I would just say, um, you know, the best way to prevent um, consolidation of uh, corporate ownership of housing is to legalize more housing. Right. We want to create more opportunities for individual homeowners, for BIPOC um, entrepreneurs um, to deliver um, more housing um, to meet the needs of communities. So allowing, um, you know, a, uh, a couple um, a, at the midpoint in their life to build an accessory dwelling unit so that, you know, a friend or their, their child or, or their grandparent or their, their parents um, can live in the neighborhood um, is a great way um, to create more um, a, a broader distribution of ownership of housing and communities. So we think that zoning reform um, is a critical step. Um, um, you know, let's face it, the large companies benefit uh, from more uh, regulation and barriers, right? And so the more that we can liberalize zoning, uh, the more um, uh, uh, we'll be able to distribute the benefits of, of investment and home ownership. Yeah, so and I would... I would just yeah, and I was going to say, and just you know, I think what's behind that question, right, is really a sense of of the vulnerability that that renters feel or people who are aspiring to get into home ownership. So how do we how do we respond to that sense of vulnerability? Yeah, I think that that from a from a policy perspective, it means that we actually have to have a permanent program or programs that can expand and contract based on need, and that helps both tenants. Who, um, who might need that assistance if we were to have another crisis or when we have another crisis, but it also helps the small landlords uh, to keep their units in place. So for example, if we were to have a housing choice voucher program that actually met the need um, and was funded at, at that kind of rate that could expand and contract when folks lose their income, it would just be a much more stable situation for both tenants and landlords and small landlords in particular. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Anne Oliva, and thank you, Mike Kinsella, for joining us today and giving us the update from Washington, D.C. Really appreciate it. And Jessica, I will transition back to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. This will be real thank quick you, because. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, this will be real quick. We just want to make sure folks who've joined more recently have an opportunity to participate. Um, you can, um, before we pivot to this next section on state housing legislation and budget, we're going to be asking a bunch of questions to which we're going to want your responses. And we want to give you an opportunity to use our tool, um, which is slido.com. So you can either use these QR codes or you can go to slido.com if you're on desktop or monitor and um, enter housing policy. Policy Forum 1, where it asks you for an event, and it'll, it'll automatically pull up the questions as we pull them up so that you can respond. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer to kick us off for the state uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So I just want to um, set the stage very briefly uh, to both um, connect state and federal policy, but also to just um, put into perspective uh, how uh, policy is really changing and how it's changed over the last few years um, so that when we hear about tons of bills, we have frameworks for sorting them and digesting uh, what they really mean for, for changing uh, how we deliver the housing that our country and, um, and our state need. Um, so next slide. Next slide, please, Jessica. Thank you. So, uh, here in our firm, we've been following um, housing policy direction for a long time. And it really uh, was in 2014 that we saw really what I think of one of the biggest pieces of, of kind of housing thought leadership uh, get written. And it was written by McKinsey Global Institute. And it was actually talking about uh, the affordable housing or housing affordability crisis globally. And so that it's not just the U.S. and it's not just the West Coast or our coastal areas and our high cost cities, uh, but really it's, it's a crisis um, of urbanization across, across the world, people coming into the cities and the cities not building the housing that we need. Um, and so that report focused entirely on production. Um, innovation, construction techniques, uh, um, zoning, land use, but that's it. Um, by 2016, McKinsey had developed a report for California, um, and it was called uh, a toolkit to close the housing the housing gap. And that is where, when you hear 3.5 million units of, of housing shortage in California that our governor often uses, that's where that number came from, from this report. This report began to move out of just production to talking about access. How do we make sure that everybody has access to housing? And through um, the Black Lives Matter movement and through COVID and, uh, and, and as, as this crisis has just gotten so much tougher in California, uh, we've really uh, began to focus not only on the physical parts of housing, but also the social parts of housing. So in the Bay Area, we had the Casa Compact, which defined uh, housing production, preservation, and the protection of tenants as its, as its three key themes. So bringing in uh, tenants and small landlords and, and the needs, the people needs side of that. Um, and at that same time, we actually in 2017 developed the first Housing Policy Leadership Academy, where we also began to look at frameworks around social determinants of health and, and around residents and displacement. Um, so next slide, please. So that's kind of the pre-COVID uh, history. Um, we have gone on to really use what we call a five P's framework and our staff is going to present legislation through this framework. So the top two P's are really social um, P's about, uh, about the, the people part of, of housing. So making sure that we promote equity and inclusion, um, access to housing for renters, um, opportunities to access home ownership and build uh, wealth and generational wealth, and that those, those opportunities for wealth building are open to all people. Um, and really understanding in California and in our cities how vulnerable certain communities are to displacement uh, when they're close to job uh, job rich areas and people are looking for cheaper places to live. And so uh, lower income communities are seeing higher income people move in and the rents are rising and lower income people are displaced. Um, so displacement, um, understanding displacement, having strategies to, um, to prevent that really important part of, of the overall housing framework. Uh, and then at the bottom, uh, really talking about um, 
housing stock. Uh, so again, as Mike really emphasized, making sure that our housing markets produce housing for everybody from the most upper end to the most lower end of our income ranges. Um, protecting the housing that we have, uh, especially the B and C quality stock and the stock that's with small landlords, because it's always cheaper to preserve than to build new. And then again, um, from a from a housing standpoint, making sure that uh, landlords, small landlords, have enough money to maintain their stock, and that landlords and tenants um, are, aren't losing uh, tenants aren't losing their housing, and landlords aren't use, losing their 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 assets that are part of their their own wealth building. Um, so this has been constantly refined during COVID. Uh, and so I just want to go to the next slide, uh, which is uh, about together. And we'll, we'll really talk about this a lot in our Housing Policy Leadership Academy that Jen is going to talk about at the end of our time together. But um, I think we all know that how we live and how we work uh, is really changing uh, as a result of COVID. So um, we've got a, a policy uh, realm around uh, how are we gonna live and what does transportation look like and how much of it do we need and where should housing be? And then we've um, got a, a path in housing policy that we all need to shape together, which is housing as a path toward restorative justice and equitable opportunities for wealth building for all. Um, so I wanna go to the next slide. Uh, and this is my final slide and I'm gonna shift to our team, but just a real quick recap. Uh, we talked about $150 billion coming out of the federal budget for housing and, and um, homelessness. And here at the state, about $22 billion uh, coming out. Again, same kinds of mixes of programs. Um, we've got COVID rent relief. Uh, we've got mortgage assistance. The 1.7 billion for the California Housing Accelerator Program is really actually about um, addressing the backlog of affordable housing development uh, projects um, that that aren't getting built because we don't have enough bond allocation. Um, uh, as as uh, our, our SCAG leaders addressed, $600 million coming down for regional early action planning grants to enable uh, regional governments and there's companion local governments to plan out the housing that we need, technical assistance and time for staff. Um, and then at the bottom on the housing side, $900 million for a whole bunch of, of programs that are connected to building housing. And then on the homelessness side, uh, also uh, money for you know, acquisition of motels and uh, building housing for the homeless, but um, also really important is $2 billion. Uh, for the first time, there's some, there's a statewide money for planning, uh, very specifically to address homelessness. Um, there's a big pot for um, preventing family homelessness. And then again, uh, some more some more money for, for um, housing um, development there at the bottom. So again, what you're seeing is a combination of planning dollars, uh, rental assistance and rental support dollars, and then dollars for development and preservation. Um, so with that just kind of big picture, I want to turn it over to Natalie and our team who are really going to walk you through uh, the trends in state legislation and in particular the bills that were just passed and signed by the governor in Sacramento. Natalie, to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And hello, everyone. My name is Natalie donlin Zapella. I'm the Director of Policy Legislation and Applications at Lassar Development Consultants. And today our team will be sharing with you a brief history of housing policies organized under this five piece framework and a summary of the key 2021 housing bills, some that have passed and some that didn't. And then after today's session, you will also have access to a PDF summary of the key bills that passed this year and these slides. So first I'll be kicking us off, if you wanna to switch to the next slide, by sharing with you more about housing policy from the lens of promoting equity and inclusion. We define this as the policy efforts that have an intentional focus on dismantling the structural and systemic barriers that prevent the promise of opportunity from being available to all. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, uh, 2017 through 2020. And as we take a look at this recent history, I invite you to think about what trends you're seeing over this time span and what may be causing them. So we're going to start in 2017. President Obama had just left office and President Trump is just beginning his presidential term. We see two bills, AB 571, which has an intentional focus on farm workers and families and giving them equitable access to state investments in affordable housing, and AB 1505, focusing on restoring the ability for local jurisdictions to adopt inclusionary housing policies. Some of you may remember this uh, bill as being referred to as the Palmer Fix. In 2018, we saw also a lot of activity. 
AB 686, uh, focusing on requiring housing elements to be consistent with HUD's affirmatively furthering fair housing requirements, two homelessness bills, and also AB 2219, which seeks to prevent homelessness by requiring landlords to accept funds from individuals and or organizations other than the tenant. Um, then in 2020, in March, we have COVID hitting the United States, and in May, George Floyd was killed. We see a lot more activity, bills establishing an office to end homelessness, uh, requiring localities to evaluate the impact of government action on communities of color, and AB 3121, creating a task force to study the issue of reparations for African Americans, including education and recommendations. You'll also see two bills, AB 3. 3269 and 3300 in orange text, which indicates the bills did not pass. So now is a chance for you to get back into Slido and weigh in on what you noticed happening during this time period of 2017 through 2020. Take a moment to share in Slido any trends that jumped out at, out at you. What did you pick up on? And what do you think was influencing these trends? I'll give you a minute to populate your answers. Yep, racism, reaction, AFFH, if that's affirmatively furthering fair housing, and equity in the housing connections, awareness of zoning as segregation, homelessness still being a priority. High taxes. Yeah, there was a pickup in legislative activity in 2017 um, and 2018. And then in 2020, we start seeing real bills beginning to focus on equity and inclusion. Um, a lot of those probably never would have happened if it wasn't for the Black Lives Matter movement and national outcry that, that came from that. Great, we really love these answers. Longer commutes, wealth disparities, further privatization, yep, COVID-19. All right, well, let's move on. Thank you so much for that. Um, now, I'd like to share a little bit more about 2021 assembly bills. Um, here's a snapshot. Uh, and, and again, you will have summaries of all of these bills um, coming after, so I won't uh, speak to all of these, but AB 721 addresses the history of segregation and redlining by establishing a process for removing exclusionary language from housing covenants for private or publicly owned land that will be developed as 100% affordable housing. Uh, AB 1043 establishes a new designation of affordability called acutely low-income households to the list of income categories for purposes of defining affordable rents, and it, would apply, it will apply throughout the state. This designation, which the County of Los Angeles began referring to as deeply low-income, includes individuals and families with incomes 15% of the area median income and below. So this will become operable in January of 2022, and HCD would presumably begin to calculate the new AMI levels in 2022 income limits that typically come out in the spring. And AB 1304 reinforces requir requirements for fair housing by clarifying existing law to ensure there's no confusion about what should be including in housing elements. Earlier attempts to implement the new fair housing requirements showed inconsistency. Some local governments didn't quantify the damage done by decades of land use discrimination and exclusion. Others didn't examine the regional context in their analysis or did not look at race in examining patterns of segregation. So this bill clarifies that all these issues must be included as part of the affirmatively furthering fair housing analysis. All right. On the next slide, we're gonna go deeper into AB 1398. This is also a production bill. It's focused on incentivizing timely compliance with housing element law and ensuring that cities and counties are adequately and responsibly rezoning to make land available for the production of housing. For background, as part of the housing element process, jurisdictions must complete a site inventory that details where housing can be built. The state's website shows that about 9% of all housing elements are currently out of compliance which is smaller than a number than in past years, but still nearly one in 10 jurisdictions are not meeting the requirements of the law. 
Now that AB 1398 has passed, jurisdic jurisdictions that fail to adopt a compliant housing element within 120 days of the statutory deadline will have only one year to complete the required rezoning instead of the current three years and 120 days. There was some concern that this legislation does not apply in, to the SCAG region, but that is not true. Um, so this bill does have some, will have major significance and can uh, reduce timelines for compliance with existing law and then adds more significant penalties. Moving on to the next slide, I'll go over some of the Senate bills. So one that did not pass that shows up in orange is SB 17, which declared that racism is a public health crisis and would have established an independent office of racial equity and require each state agency to develop and implement a racial equity plan. Um, SB 478 will cover in the next slide. And then next is SB 591, which creates a new housing designation for intergenerational housing, including seniors, transition age youth, and caregivers. So moving into SB uh, 478, this is meant to facilitate the development of missing middle or small scale housing, making it um, infeasible for cities to zone for multifamily, but set floor area ratio or lot size requirements that effectively make it um, multifamily developments impossible to build. So as background, floor area ratio or FAR is the total usable square footage that a building has or is permitted to have divided by the total area of the lot on which the building stands. A higher FAR implies an urban or more denser construction. Many jurisdictions use FAR to protect um, neighborhood character and create local zoning codes, but research has shown that low FARs and high minimum lot sizes can predict higher housing costs, lower housing growth, and we're, also, we're less likely to be home to Black, Latinx communities and blue collar workers. So according to the bill's sponsor, SB 478 does not require local ent entities to allow multifamily housing in places where they haven't already said it was permitted. Rather, it just puts important guardrails on design standards to ensure that housing that is planned and included in the jurisdiction's housing element is actually allowed to move forward. So this bill is a companion bill to SB 7, I'm sorry, SB 10, and you'll hear about more on that in the next section on production. And so now my colleague Farzad will walk you through the bills focused on production. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie, and, and thank you all for having me here. It's um, it's really great to be part of this. I'm Farzad Mashud. I'm an associate at Lasar Development Consultants, um, and I, am, I work on the housing team. I'll be presenting on recent trends in state legislation related to producing housing for all, which is one of the five Ps. So this is just kind of one leg of our solutions framework that we're looking at. So just looking um, at bills that were passed recently from 2017 to 2019, there were many production-oriented bills uh, passed during this time, you can see. And it's really been an area of focus for the legislature. Um, broadly, these bills touch on themes such as unlocking land, enabling more land to be developed for housing, reducing risk and unnecessary regulation associated with producing housing, and, and making private sector development more financially feasible. 2017 was an especially big year of housing legislation. It included two uh, very well-known bills that many of you I'm sure are familiar with, SB2, which not only created one-year planning grants um, that are the sort of predecessor to LEAP and REAP that were mentioned at the beginning of this session, um, and then also a permanent housing fund uh, that, that localities can access um, to build affordable housing. And then SB35, which is a major streamlining bill uh, that comes up all the time today. 2018 kind of continued this trend of streamlining bills, especially for homeless housing. And 2019, the first year of Governor Newsom's term, uh, is most notable for the creation of additional planning grants, REAP, Regional Early Action Planning, and LEAP, Local Early Action Planning. Uh, this program that you're a part of today is funded through REAP, uh, as well as the um, Housing Policy Forum that Jenna will talk about at the end. Next slide. Um, I'm going to now talk about 2020. Uh, this is a year you, you, I'm sure, all remember, began with a very ambitious housing agenda, both in the Senate and in the Assembly. This slide shows the principal um, housing production bills from the 2020 session. Uh, on the left, the Senate, uh, the ones with asterisks are the Senate's housing package, and then on the right, the Assembly. Uh, but then with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that not only took a lot of attention from the legislature, 
but also prevented the legislature from having a full session to really um, discuss all of these bills. So a few of these bills passed. You can see here the ones in black are the bills that passed. Uh, and really these, the themes of these bills are infill um, with smaller scale development, low to moderate income housing production, and then continuing the trend of streamlining, uh, which helps lower the cost of developing new housing. So that was a very quick uh, review of uh, recent trends in, in housing bills. On the next slide, we're gonna really turn it to you and hear from you um, to go to Slido. And we'd love to hear from you what trends you've seen happening um, in housing bills, particularly production related um, legislation. So you can, uh, you can open up your Slido um, and uh, please feel free to enter in um, what you've been seeing, reactive bills, uh-huh. Discard for disregard for neighborhood character. Okay, we've got a few more parking, one size fits all solutions, streamlining, uh, ADUs. Been a lot of ADU bills, yes. Uh, a lot of one size fits all comments. Lots of local control, I see. Um, yeah, turning more urban areas. Very good. These are great comments. Thank, thank you all for, for your input here. Um, if it's okay, I can uh, continue on. Um, so on the next slide, uh, these are now uh, the bills that have come before the legislature um, in this last session, 2021. Um, so uh, the, the, these are major housing production bills from this the session that just ended. So first I wanna talk about um, some of the production related bills in the Senate's housing package. Um, SB6 and SB15 shown here in the orange. These are bills that did not pass and they were both related to helping cities reuse and redevelop uh, infill commercial properties, such as strip malls, big box retail, um, and to redevelop those as multifamily residential properties. Um, it's SB6, would have allowed underutilized or unused commercial to be reused as multifamily through a ministerial process. And SB 15 would have created a financial incentive for cities that are doing this, essentially by paying cities um, for the foregone sales taxes uh, that they would have, that they would not be getting by uh, getting rid of commercial properties. And then SBs 7, 8, 9, and 10, uh, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. These all did pass. So uh, first, SB7, this is a CEQA bill and uh, the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, and this bill extends the benefits of streamlining CEQA to smaller infill projects, uh, projects that cost between $15 million and $100 million, so long as 15% of the units are affordable to low-income households. This is a major bill because it's streamlining a large range of projects um, and projects that come at a smaller scale than than those that particularly have access to streamlining. Um, I'm gonna skip SBA. We're gonna talk about that in much more detail in a later part, but I just wanna note that that is a production related bill. SB9 uh, makes lot splits and duplexes ministerial on single family lots. Uh, this essentially ends single family zoning, not single family housing, just single family zoning in California. Um, and this bill builds on the increasing support for smaller scale housing uh, throughout the state. Um, you, you've sh surely seen this rise in development of accessory dwelling units um, throughout California, but in particular in the Los Angeles area, they're now the fastest growing housing type around the state. Uh, much of the new housing being built in Southern California are accessory dwelling units. Um, this bill kind of takes what's been happening with accessory dwelling units and opens that up to duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, um, opening up a lot more land, uh, particularly in high opportunity, highly desirable areas where uh, it, there's uh, off, much more commonly found exclusive single family zoning. The UC Berkeley Turner Center did an analysis of this bill's potential and found that there are 700,000 new market feasible units as a result of this law. Uh, and about a fifth of those a little more than 125,000 are in Los Angeles County. Um, almost half of them are in the Skag region. 
It's important to note that not every unit that is feasible will get built. It requires a homeowner to want to build a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex. Um, and, and that's sort of the point of this bill. It's not going to immediately change uh, res existing residential areas, but rather opens up many existing residential areas to uh, accommodate more housing. Uh, it also has, important to note, it has displacement protections, such as requiring owner occupancy and certain tenant protections um, to, to prevent people from getting pushed out of um, homes they've been renting for a long time. And then um, SB 10, this is sort of the cousin of SB 478, which Natalie mentioned. Uh, this is another small scale housing bill, um, but it requires localities to opt in. It doesn't apply to cities. Um, it's not a mandate on cities. Cities can choose to adopt this. And essentially what it allows is if, if a city chooses, it can adopt zoning that allows small apartment buildings up to 10 units in single family areas that are near transit and near job centers and in infill areas. Um, this could be a very significant bill. We, we don't know. Uh, it really depends on how, how many cities opt into it. Next slide um, is a couple more Senate bills I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first two listed on this slide, 477 and 679, did not pass. 477 would have required cities and counties to include some additional information on their annual progress reports um, that, are, that document housing production. And then 679, that would have created the Los Angeles County Affordable Housing Solutions Agency, or La Casa. We're going to talk about this a lot more in another section, but important to know this is an agency that would have had the power to raise funds and build affordable housing. Uh, two bills that did pass, SB 780 and 791. 780 would have authorized several changes to enhanced infrastructure financing districts, EIFDs and community revitalization of infrastructure authorities. It's fairly technical, but just the important point we wanna convey here is this would allow localities to better use these tools to create affordable housing as well as other important investments. And then 791 establishes a new unit in the state housing department called the California Surplus Land Unit. Uh, this would facilitate development and construction of residential housing on locally owned surplus land essentially creating a resource that the state can assist uh, localities that may not have expertise to handle um, development on their own surplus property on their own. Um, now, assembly bills, recent assembly bills from 2021. Uh, most of these listed here in orange did not pass. I'll touch on those briefly, AB 115. This is sort of the cousin of SB 6, which as you remember, it would allow residential housing in commercial zones. Um, if certain conditions are met, including 20% of the units needing to be affordable to low-income housing. 989 would have created an office to handle appeals of alleged violations on the Housing Accountability Act. 1401, this is a, a really well-known one, I think, uh, would have gotten rid of uh, some minimum parking requirements near transit. And then 1423 was vetoed. Uh, it would have allowed affordable housing developers who are receiving uh, certain state uh, housing dollars to receive those uh, loans earlier in the process during construction rather than uh, later in the process. This would have um, helped uh, address some barriers in the development process for affordable developers. And then the uh, important assembly bill that did pass, uh, 215, uh, this is sort of a housing element accountability bill, and the biggest account, uh, outcome of this is that it creates a mid-cycle check-in on RENA. If a city or county is behind on RENA, it has to consult with HCD to adopt new policies, and it also addresses other um, elements of enforcement. So uh, again, I want to turn it back to you all now. We'll go to the next slide, and we want to um, point you all to Slido again. So we've presented a lot of production-related um, solutions, bills, um, as well as bills that didn't pass, but um, uh, kind of show tools that are being considered. We want to hear from you. What solutions do you see? Um, what are promising solutions uh, related to producing more housing that we've presented on um, or, or, or that um, you know of otherwise that will be promising in your community? 
So a great rezoning funded by SB2. And th this is um, a, a great thing about LEAP and REAP is that uh, they, they created funding localities can access to um, do some of the, to do their housing elements and also some of the implementation. Um, so we see money um, still going to have single family, opt-in bills, redevelopment, state overriding restrictive localities, local housing trust funds. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. so, and, and those the state will uh, kind of supplement any local money coming in. Redevelopment, SB9, building taller, encouraging density, coordination across agencies, vacancy tax, kindness, Great. So um, I think I think we'll, for the sake of time, we'll move on to the next session. I want to turn it over to my colleague, Anne-Marie. Thanks so much, Farzad. Uh, as just mentioned, my name is, so I'm Anne-Marie Rodriguez. I'm an associate at Lazar Development Consultant. I'll be walking us through our section on preserving vulnerable housing. Um, as in, implied by the title, this piece is about taking steps to preserve vulnerable housing. Ideally, after an analysis has been done that determines whether it's more cost-effective to preserve or to replace the housing. As we look at related bills, I invite you to be thinking about which of these strategies would be the most effective in meeting your community's unique need to preserve this type of housing. So as we move to the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, in the previous four years, there are four pieces of legislation that were passed, which we've identified as sitting under this category of preservation. Just the sheer difference in the amount of legislation displayed here compared, compared to our previous section shows that there's been a clear focus on affordable housing production. Bills focus on preservation have been relatively minor, but still significant. The first bill shown here from 2017 is AB 1521. This bill requires sellers of multifamily subsidized housing to entertain offers from nonprofits and others able to maintain subsidies in order for that housing to maintain its affordability. The second bill shown is SB 136. It allows existing funds to be used toward technical assistance for mobile home park residents in acquiring, operating, and improving mobile home parks occupied by low and moderate income households. Um, we then have SB 330 here. This bill established the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. As it relates to preservation, this act sets requirements for replacing affordable housing when it is demolished by a development project. In effect, this component of the bill would work to ensure there's no net loss in the number of current units. And then in 2020, building on project room key, project home key utilizes money from the federal uh, COVID relief fund to continue the statewide effort to sustain and rapidly expand housing for persons experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness and impacted by COVID-19. Eligible uses of Project Home Key that pertain to preservation include purchasing affordability covenants and restrictions for units um, from either Project Room Key properties or other properties in order to maintain their deep affordability. And so as we move to the next slide, you can see there's relatively more activity this year in 2021 and then in the past towards preservation efforts. Um, we'll start with the bill shown in orange, which as mentioned signifies that it did not pass. SB 679, uh, which as I mentioned in our previous section, uh, contain provisions that would have worked to preserve housing units affordable to households earning up to 80% of the area of median income. And then going back to the top of this slide, SB 8 uh, extends the sunset date of the Housing Crisis Act of 2019 by five years. And in doing so, extends the replacement provisions I just mentioned in the previous slide that were put in place by SB 330. And we have AB 140, which establishes two main programs that are worth highlighting here. Um, first, it creates the Foreclosure Intervention Housing Preservation Program to acquire property at risk of or in foreclosure and to preserve affordable housing and promote resident ownership. The other main component is that this bill also provides money to ensure that HCD funded development with expiring subsidies remain affordable. Um, AB 1029 adds preservation of affordable housing units to the list of eligible pro-housing policies that HCD can consider in developing its pro-housing designation. Um, many of you may be familiar with this. For those who aren't, this designation uh, can be received by local governments and in turn, it provides them with an advantage when applying for various funding programs. 
And then last on the list here, we have AB 787. Um, this utilizes each region's housing element to address the need for missing middle or moderate income housing. And we'll turn to the next slide to explain more in depth on how that, it accomplishes that. So for a bit of context to start, um, this bill was created in response to several agencies that developed a new conversion model to provide housing affordable to moderate income households without using public subsidy. AB 787, uh, incentivizes jurisdictions to meet their missing middle housing need by allowing housing established through this model to count towards meeting up to 25% of each region's moderate income housing element goals. Um, this, however, is contingent on the housing having a minimum 55 year fee restriction and new rents that are at least 10% lower than the rent charged over the 12 months prior to its conversion in order to maintain its affordability. And this bill was signed in September of this year and will go into effect on January 1 of 2022. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. And this is another opportunity for you to engage. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this segment, we're curious to hear which strategies, you know, either included in or outside of the legislation we just looked at, that you believe would be most effective in preserving vulnerable housing within the community you live or work in. So I'll now give you a moment to answer this via Slido. Yeah, okay, so statewide TOPA, which is Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, redevelopment funds, more funding, systematic code enforcement we see. Yeah. Rent stabilization, redevelopment funds getting boosted. Let's see what else. not allowing corporations to purchase housing stock. Okay. These are great responses. Thank you for your participation through this. We also see multi-generational housing, housing for homeless students, rent to own models, rent stabilization. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your participation on this. This is, this is great. Um, I'll now hand it off to my colleague Edwin to walk us through our next section. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Hi, everyone. My name is Edwin Pert, and I'm an associate with Lazar Development Consultants, and I'm going to walk us through two of the five Ps, the first being preventing displacement, um, while also providing a lens to understanding gentrification, and then number two, protecting tenants, which, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, also includes protecting small landlords during the COVID crisis. So we're going to cover bills that prevent displacement first, followed by bills that protect tenants and landlords. And after we go through both separately, uh, we'll give, uh, get your thoughts on both P's at the end of this section. So as we discuss specific bills related to these two P's, be thinking about policies and programs that help prevent displacement and protect tenants and small landlords. So prior to 2020, there wasn't much legislation that directly addressed preventing displacement. Um, however, part of 2020's ambitious housing agenda included two important bills. Uh, the first being AB 1885, which expands homestead exemption bankruptcy protections for homeowners and thereby increasing protected equity amounts to the greater of $300,000. And we also want to highlight SB 1079, uh, which is intended to reduce speculation by limiting bulk purchasing of homes at a single auction and authorizes local governments to levy high fines on corporations or property owners to incentivize uh, refurbishing and renting or selling. So now we're gonna to move to uh, 2021 legislation, starting with AB 71, also known as the Bring California Home Act. So this bill would have established a permanent source of funding and a collaborative statewide strategy for solving homelessness through funding from large and multinational corporations. Uh, next, we have AB 1487, which was vetoed by Governor Newsom in early October. And this bill is significant in that it would have established the Homelessness Prevention Fund to provide direct legal aid services, education, and outreach to low-income tenant households facing the threat of eviction or imminent displacement from their homes. Next, we have SB 8, which we'll go more in depth on on the next slide. And then lastly, we have AB 787, and this bill allows a local jurisdiction to count above uh, moderate income units that are converted into moderate income units toward up to 25% of their moderate income housing goal in their housing element. 
So now we want to highlight SBA because of its significance in preventing displacement. So as mentioned earlier, uh, SB 8 extends the Housing Crisis Act to 2030, which has been an important tool for streamlining approvals by restricting the number of hearings local governments can require and putting in place requirements that ensure that down zonings don't decrease the number of potential homes included in the locality's uh, available site inventory, among other things. And as background, uh, SB 330 has a sunset of January 1st, 2025, but it's important to note that most of the time uh, since the bill was approved has been during COVID. So it isn't yet clear uh, whether these new provisions in practice have sped up the timeline for project approvals and ultimately reduced housing costs. So this bill will go into effect uh, January 1st of 2022, and it requires HCD to update the list of affected jurisdictions a second time on or after January 1st of 2025. So now we're going to turn to protecting tenants and small landlords. So looking at recent history, we want to highlight two bills from 2019. The first being SB 329, which prohibits landlords from discriminating against tenants who rely upon housing assistance paid directly to landlords. Um, and there's also AB 1482, also known as the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which limits annual rent increases to 5% plus the cost of inflation until 2023. And in 2020, in 2020, as part of the big housing agenda, we see AB 3088, which ensured that COVID impacted renters who missed payments through August were protected from evictions until February 2021. Second, we have AB 3182, which requires common interest developments to allow owners to rent or lease units. We also have AB 1436, which was intended to provide uh, temporary eviction relief to tenants during the COVID state of emergency, plus 90 days. And then lastly, we have SB 1410, which uh, would allow renters and landlords to enter into rent stabilization agreements prior to eviction. Okay, so here is a snapshot of bills from this year. Um, so we'll start with the bills that didn't pass. Uh, so as mentioned before, SB 649 was intended to support uh, local tenant preferences for uh, lower income households at risk of displacement and would have allowed local governments and developers that receive affordable housing funding to restrict occupancy to those at risk of displacement. Second, we have AB 889, which would have required corporations or LLCs owning and operating residential rental property to report the identity of the beneficial owner of the property to the California Secretary of State. Um, and then we have AB 1487, which was already covered. Um, and this bill also aims to protect tenants by establishing the Homelessness Prevention Fund. So now we'll cover a few bills that passed this year. Uh, we'll start with SB 91 that passed in January and it extended the eviction moratorium provisions established originally by AB 3088 until June 30th, 2021. And the passage of this bill protected tenants who pay at least 25% of their um, old rent from eviction and preempts local governments from changing local rules. Um, it also established a state rental assistance program to distribute uh, those federal funds. Um, we also have AB 832 which was signed into law in June and extended tenant, landlord, and homeowner protections through September 30th of this year, uh, increasing emergency rental assistance reimbursements to 100% for past and future payments, and ensuring that landlords attempt to secure rental assistance before courts can order an eviction. And lastly, we have AB 838, which we'll go more in depth on in the next slide, but it requires local governments to respond to lead hazard and substandard building complaints from tenants and other specified parties. So now we're gonna highlight uh, AB 838. So just to provide some context, uh, renters face certain challenges in obtaining inspections for uh, lead hazards and substandard building conditions, uh, creating serious health and safety risks. And AB 838 provides a path for tenants to obtain inspection reports for their units and removes preconditions on inspections, such as proof that the landlord or property manager have been unresponsive, that have made it challenging for tenants to respond to hazardous conditions. And because renters may be hesitant to complain directly to their landlord or property manager, this bill will give them more uh, opportunity to seek repairs and ensure that their housing is safe and habitable. And this bill was passed in September of this year and takes effect on July 1st of 2022. So now here's an opportunity to hear from you again. So uh, using Slido to share your thoughts, uh, what are some promising policies and programs you're seeing to prevent displacement and protect tenants? 
see what we get here. None. That's a reality. Rent stabilization. SB 1079. None again. We need financial education. COVA rentals and utility assistance at state level. Um, none again popped up. Legal help. AB 1482. Protect small landlords, extend to mobile home parks. See, rental okay. assistance. Kindness. Yeah. Communication, absolutely. And Edwin, I was just gonna say, in the interest of time, if you wanna if you wanna pivot on. Yeah, so these are all great programs and policies. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. So now I'll turn it over to Natalie to uh, walk us through forecasting housing policies and legislation in 2022 and beyond. Great, thank you so much, Edwin and everyone. Um, let me get ready. Okay, so that was a lot of information we shared with you. And don't worry, after today's session, you will have access to reference summary of key housing bills passed this year and a copy of today's slides. We'll also be getting back to you on questions that we haven't been able to answer in real time. Now we'd like to take a moment to just do a bit of forecasting for what is to come next year and the years beyond in terms of housing policy. So to start, we invite you to participate in this quick poll that has some topics just to help kind of warm up your thinking. And then next we'll do an open-ended question where we really wanna hear from you about what else you think will be prominent housing policy issues that will come up in 2022. I know there's been a lot of um, boosting to questions on corporate ownership and re more regulation around that. So I imagine that's something uh, that a lot of folks here would wanna see addressed um, in future housing policy. So it looks like we're getting um, a lot of feedback in, thank you. More funding, um, increasing funding to preserve and build. Cross-sector policy solutions and approaches, great. Updates to zoning, making it easier to build and making land available. Awesome. Now let's go on to the next slide. And what do you think is really missing? Um, there's been some great uh, questions coming in about some of those items, I think. So this is your opportunity to kind of prioritize those. Give you a minute. You know, one thing, um, home ownership opportunities has also come up and we've become a majority renter state. Um, and with the 3 million invested in the California Dream for All in the 2021 budget, and ADU financing, we should see more of that kind of legislative activity um, and more homes that will look different than single family homes to support mo more ownership. Farm worker housing's coming up again. Home ownership, great. Gap financing, tenant opportunity to purchase again. Uh, infrastructure funding, more SECA reform, more dedicated funding, corporate ownership, yep, all right. Great, so on the next slide, um, we just wanna showcase a few of the uh, key bills that we we are forecasting to come back. Um, so uh, first up, commercial land for housing. We saw two bills, SB6 and AB115, aimed to help developers build new homes on commercial, commercially zoned land, but these got caught up in conversations on skilled labor. SB 15 would have established a program administered by the state to provide grants to cities and counties to rezone idle or underutilized commercial and big box retailer um, shopping centers. So this shift in thinking on using commercial land for housing uh, really speaks to our new life with COVID and how our ways of working and patterns of living are changing. Um, there's been some reports that are new coming out from the Turner Center um, on commercial property that are going to be released soon, and we'll pop the link in the chat. Um, regional housing agencies is another one, um, given the need to respond to the housing shortage with regional solutions. In the last minutes of the ledge session, SB 679 failed to move, and this would have established the LA County Affordable Housing Solutions Agency. 
Um, SB 679 was modeled after AB 1487 in 2019, which um, created a regional housing entity for San Francisco Bay Area, known as the Bay Area Housing Finance Agency, or BAFA. These bills make it clear that regional coordination and local subsidies are really going to be important tools to scale up housing solutions and help jurisdictions meet their RENA targets. In some ways, this is how communities are responding to the loss of redevelopment agencies, along with other tools like EIFDs and CREAs that can provide local financing for housing and also multi-benefit projects, including infrastructure. So that's a way to kind of get to that cross-sectoral collaboration. We've also heard efforts to support seismic retrofit funding for affordable multifamily properties are likely to come next year. And then there's two constitutional amendments to keep an eye out for. We expect to see efforts to repeal Article 34, which requires a vote of the electorate when a local government seeks to build or fund affordable housing will come back, along with calls to amend ACA 1 that would lower the voter threshold for affordable housing finance measures from two thirds of the state voters to 55%. So looking forward to another exciting and hopefully active year in housing policy. Now I'm gonna kick it back to Jenna Hornstock to share more about new opportunities for you to stay engaged and be part of housing policy solutions into 2022. Wonderful, thank you everyone. So just quickly, cause we're gonna end on time. I wanna thank the Lasar team and our panelists for your time today. Thanks to our internal SCAG housing staff who's been working really hard um, to pull this together. Um, I want to share two things with you, really exciting opportunities, again, um, through our REIT program and SCAG's really expanded focus on, on engaging in housing policy and, and advancing housing production. First um, is the Housing Policy Leadership Academy that we uh, have been talking about. So this is um, a 10 session over 10 months that will look at the root causes of the housing crisis, discuss best practice policy solutions, looking both at physical, and social and political factors um, that underpin the housing ecosystem. Um, the way this works is there will be uh, eight cohorts of up to 40 people, and these are divided up by uh, geographic subregions. So we're gonna group folks um, into subregions, each cohort will up to 40 people. So that's about 320 people that we can accommodate to get this deep dive and become experts um, in advancing and accelerating housing production. Um, as part of the course, the participants will work in small groups. You'll develop outcome-based policy proposals to address the housing crisis and challenges in your community or region. Um, and so importantly, if you see here on the slide, who should apply, um, there's a whole list of different kinds of folks. We know that a healthy housing ecosystem has stakeholders from diverse backgrounds. And we know that um, folks in communities and elected officials rely on a really diverse group of folks to show up and support um, transformative land use planning that will address our housing crisis. Um, so if you identify with any of the groups you see on this list, we encourage you to apply. And here's the exciting moment. We're having our big drop like when you see out on the street where Fairfax Avenue, the big drop of the new shoes, we are dropping the application process today. Uh, it's live uh, on the SCAG website. I think we're putting that in the chat um, and you can, um, or you could just Google it and look on our SCAG webpage under our housing program. You can apply anytime today through January 10th, 22. Uh, we're gonna bother you with emails and, and remind you. Um, we would love for you to circulate this with your networks. If this isn't for you, but you know the right person, please let them know. Uh, and after our January 10th deadline, um, we will notify you all within about a week uh, because our first session will kick off the first week of February, 2022. So again, this is once a month for 10 months. Um, there will be training sessions. There'll be kind of homework in between. So this is a time commitment, but a lot of amazing information for you. So that is the first announcement. And again, we should be dropping that info in the chat or you can look on the SCAD webpage and we will be emailing you to remind you. Um, a second quick announcement I wanted to make is that SCAG is forming a regional housing planning working group. So we have a number of working groups around core policy areas and they come together to help inform the development of the RTP SCS. Um, as many of you know, one of the core things SCAG does every four years is develop the Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy. Um, so we're opening up a housing focused planning group we're gonna start by meeting quarterly, but if big issues come up to discuss, we could have subcommittees. Our first meeting will be December 15th. And again, we, we will be emailing folks on our stakeholder list. If you signed up for this event today, we've got your email and we know you're interested in housing. 
Um, but also we should be dropping in the chat a link to SCAG's uh, Regional Planning Working Group page. So again, another opportunity to help engage with us and help us shape the work that we do at the regional level. Um, so again, look at the chat um, for links to the Leadership Academy application. Um, also look for links to the Planning Working Group. And finally, we, want, we have a survey. So you can tell us um, how we did with this forum and importantly, how we can make the next ones um, even better. Um, so with that, I have the pleasure of concluding um, our first SCAG Housing Policy Forum. And thank you so much for joining us.